All right, our text this morning is from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Then Solomon said, You have shown great faithfulness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth, righteousness, and uprightness of heart towards you. And you have reserved for him this great faithfulness, that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Yet I am like a little boy. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is capable of judging this great people of yours? Now it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and not asked for a long life, or for riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the lives of your enemies, I have done according to your... Uh, I'm sorry. But have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your word. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, <clears throat> so that there is no one like before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. Two friends met at a, a, for dinner in a restaurant. Each one requested a filet of sole. And after a few minutes, the waiter came back with their order. Two pieces of fish, a large one, and a small one were on the same platter. One of the men pre proceeded to serve his friend. Placing the small piece on a plate, he handed it across the table. Well, you certainly have the nerve, said his friend. Well, what's troubling you? asked the first. The second replies, well, look what you've done. You've given me the little piece and you kept the big one for yourself. And so the first man replies, well, how would you have done it? And his friend replied, well, if I were serving, I would have given you the big piece. Well, replied the first, I've got it, haven't I? <laughs> At this, they both, as you are, they both laughed. My sermon in a sentence this week is this, and so... If you are not aware of this, if you're here for a first time, if you're visiting, this is my summary statement of what you are about to receive through me from God. And today's actually comes directly from Scripture. This is not my own original sentence, but it says it uh, so well, so fittingly today. So, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Me or we. You're going to hear me use those two words a lot. It's a question that faces us every day as we say our prayers, as we make decisions, as we establish priorities, and frankly, just as we go about living our lives. Do we make choices for our benefit or for the benefit of others? Do we live as insulated and isolated individuals or as a person connected to and interdependent with others? Now, me living doesn't just apply to a single individual. Me could be a group. It could be an organization, it could be a business. So when I use the word me living, it isn't just about one individual person. So it's, this message is not just solely for you individually, but it's also for you, us, 
collectively as a body. So when I use that, understand it's a choice that is made by nations. It's also a choice that can be made by political parties, corporations, and yes, even churches. Now it's the question that Solomon faced when God came to him in a dream. And he asked the question that I imagine we probably would all love to have God ask us. He says, what would you like me to give you? It sounds like a great deal. In, 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 a, in a sense, it sounds like God has written a blank check and handed it to Solomon for whatever he wants. All he needs to do is to fill in the amount, what it is that he wants that to be filled with. Who hasn't wished that scenario in some way in their life? If things could just be, problems could be just removed from our life, if our lives could just be stress-free, if I could just have enough money to never have to worry about things. Or if this person over here who's causing me discomfort. I mean, last week, remember, we talked about how David responded to Saul. His response, now, most people in David's positions would have wished Saul away and maybe even wanted to see him dead. If you're like me, at some point in your life, you've probably played the game. If you could have anything in the world, what would it be? But in this case, it isn't that simple. It isn't just a game. It's real life and death. God's question comes with a dilemma. And Solomon's answer will carry profound consequences. He's got to decide between asking for something for himself, me living, or asking for the larger community, the we living, of which he is also a part. That question came in the night in the form of a dream. Now, when we read that in Scripture, you have to understand, we, we view dreams a lot of times differently. We, you know, we wake up and sometimes I hear people say, it must have been something I ate last night. Like, that's how we tend to treat dreams. We need to understand what's going on here, that when he talks about it in a dream, yes, it actually happened, and yes, it also reveals that it's coming from some deep, interior place, and that his answer is going to come from a deep internal place in his heart. What is it? What is it? God is just, in essence, saying, what is it that your heart longs for? What is it that you desire <coughs> to be done? What is your living motivation? We are often blind and unaware of this choice between me and we. Because we look, a decision comes up, and how often when things get stressful, or we've got to make a decision that we think is critical, and all of a sudden the blinders go up, and all we can see is what's five feet around us. It's as though we lose the ability at times to focus on the fact that our decisions impact so many. Every decision we make has a ripple effect, oftentimes much of which we don't ever know until later on, if, if we even know. But we are wired, if you will, not by God, but wired by the choices that we see in our society. We are trained, maybe is a better word, to think about me first. I'm hungry right now. Let me, you know, let me just, you know, I'm going to just leave you guys, you guys finish the service, I'm going to go grab some food for myself so that I got a full stomach. I'm serious. <laughs> but when disruptions occur in our life, Something, something that might throw our life out of balance, something that challenges us or troubles us or frightens us, we almost immediately have to think about a response. 
We don't have, we, oftentimes it's second nature. Something happens, you, you just, you, you roll with the punches. You're like, I got to make a decision now. Questions that come up all the time. What are we going to do about this? How will we do it? But the reality is that those are secondary questions. The primary thing that is developed or revealed in these moments is the condition of our heart and how we will respond. Are we aware of others that might be affected by what's going on? Do we care? Maybe we know all too well what's going to happen and we are okay with that. As long as we get what's ours. It's not how Jesus lived and not what he taught. His was not a me, me, me life of teaching. So what about us? Are we wired that way? Are we living that way, that it's me, me, me? What can I gain from this? Or are we aware of the we living, the condition of, of those around us, and the effects of the decisions, the things we choose to say, both for good and sometimes things that maybe should have been left unsaid. Now the answer to this question will likely determine the quality, and it maybe has in your lifetime, the quality of the relationships, and even the amount of time you find yourself in conflict. Look at our world today. Can't tell you how many times I've heard this. People, you know, we talk, the, the news, the media gets brought up and they say, I don't listen to that anymore. Well, there's a reason, there's a number of reasons why probably, but look at it for a minute. But don't stop there. Look at your own personal relationships. What are your relationships like with your spouse, with your kids, with your brothers, sisters, parents, grandkids? If there's conflict there somewhere underneath, it's probably a result of some me attitude. We see it in wars. We've seen it in the persecution of Christians. We see it even in the debate about how best to handle issues that are very divisive in our nation, like immigration. Those are challenging issues about the, the lives. We have the, the, the vantage point that we have as an American but we also have, more importantly, the vantage point of being a believer. And we need to understand that, that our principles are guided not first and foremost by the principles of this land, whether we agree with them or even some of the things that have shifted, then we may disagree with them. When we seek a foundation of truth, look for the word. The word doesn't shift. That's the center of our living and what it ought to be. But let's make this more pointed. It isn't about global issues. I find when, we, when I have conversations about this stuff, it's real easy to steer the conversation towards the problems that are out there. In the cities, oh, we're so thankful we're not there. You know what? The problems reside here as well. And the problems that reside here as well are more important in some ways. Because they are issues, I mean, they are, those are issues of the heart, but these are issues of our hearts, too. We need to address the fact that these me attitudes <coughs> exist in our marriages, they exist in our families, they exist in our workplaces. They existed, if you think back over... Ten years ago, we were just kind of getting started as a couple. We had bought a house. It was as a result of the economic failures in this country. And what result, what led to that? Well, a lot of me, 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 let me get my hands on stuff. That caused the collapse. People seeking to gain personal 
benefits, personal kingdoms, if you will, not worried about what would be the fallout for others. We see it in prejudice and discrimination. We see it at times where we can become very hardened about our position and saying, we know exactly what the truth is. <clears throat> We're willing to cast aside people and treat them differently or less because they don't fit our picture. How many of you have conflict in your life? Or maybe it's better if I say, if you don't, stand up. <laughs> we better sit down here a second. <laughs> but, so you have conflict. It's real. And so the, the issue here is, is going back and saying, okay, where is the me life showing up there? What is my responsibility in whatever conflict is in my life? What is your responsibility for whatever conflict is in your life? And what are you going to do about it? How are you going to change your actions, your attitudes, your words? How are you going to seek to reconcile that conflict? Do you believe that you're supposed to reconcile with your brother? I'm not just talking about your earthly brother. So do it. Don't wait. Where there's conflict, do your part. Now you may be thinking, well, what if they don't want to reconcile? Do your part. Seek to reconcile those relationships. If for no other reason, and primarily your reason should be for, the, for, for, for a representation of who Christ was. Now I'm not going to suggest, sit here and suggest that if you all just start living a we life, that that's going to fix all of our problems. It's not. We acknowledge that sin's still going to be there. It's not going to settle every debate. It's not that simple. But it will change. You'll find that if you shift that in your life, it will change how you approach people. It'll change how you approach a debate or a conflict. You may choose to take the higher road once in a while if you are a person that doesn't mind a little conflict. But ultimately, it's about being aware to those around us and that we are interconnected. I saw the beauty of that in a, in a, in a small way in the memorial service for Rick. The interweavings of people within the community and how much he was loved by all of you. And, and you know, and, and I count that day as complete joy other than the loss of him as a brother, but knowing where he is, knowing that he's free of pain, but just the fellowship and the gathering around the we, it was it's not about me today or any day it should be, but it's it's about doing this to help the family, to help minister to people to bring glory to who God is. Now, isn't that kind of like what Solomon asked for? Let's go back to Solomon here for a minute. Instead of asking for money or for the removal of other people that he might have wanted, he sought for a mind to, to govern God's people with care. He wanted the ability to discern good and evil. He recognized that having a me attitude could not sustain the kingdom. He even referred to himself, if you caught this, I found it very ironic, he refers to himself as a little child. And that he didn't know how to go in or, or to go out or come in. His concern was for the kingdom at that point, not himself. Now that shift from me to we is not easy. It means that you have to let go of some of the past patterns of your life. You have to maybe be willing to suspend some judgments. Say, so, you know, I think this is what's going on here, but I don't know the full story. 
or someone else told me this, well, let's go to the source. We may need to redirect our attention to the future that we want, that we know that God wants for us. And that future, as was said in the Lord's Prayer, is he wants the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. So that shift happens, but it usually will happen from within us before it happens out there. We want the change out there today. But the change out there, you know, we're praying for the change, change in the way people are uh, behaving in Minnesota and in this country. The change starts in here, in our hearts. It must start there. So what does that shift look like? I wrote down a few examples. What does a we life look like? This is not conclu- you know, this is not everything. There's plenty more we could come up with, but in a in a way, what does it look like to live like Jesus? So when we live a me-centered life, it's characterized, I'm sorry, it's one of power, dominion, and control. We just want stuff for ourselves. We want to be in charge. We want the chips to be played so that we, it's to our advantage. A we life is being willing to be vulnerable, to, be, uh, to show intimacy, and to be self-giving. A me life is characterized by a rhetoric, frenzied response, or isolation. Oh, you don't agree with me? I'm just going to remove myself from you. Oh, you think you know what you're talking about? Here's what I know. And we can talk again once you get in line. A we life is characterized by silence, by stillness and presence. Silence is uncomfortable, isn't it? For a lot of people. But you learn a lot when you listen. A me life is filled with doubt, cynicism, and fear. A we life, when we focus on the needs of others along with ourselves, is filled with faith, hope, and love. A we life clings tightly to the past. A we life embodies what may be. I don't... I have my past. I have the experiences I have from my past. I know what I like and dislike from my past. But that isn't everything, that isn't what makes the world go around. A me life draws lines to divide. A we life draws circles that encompass. Now Solomon had an opportunity. I wasn't going to refer to this story initially, Jeff. Sorry, it's, in, it's not in there, but I'm going to say this. There's this key story in here that you're probably all aware of where Solomon has two women that come before him with a baby. And so you remember, his, in his wisdom, he asks the first woman what to do, what she wants done with the baby. And she says, split it in two, that way we each get half. What's she doing there? I mean, it makes me wonder what parent would say that. What, you know, who's going to benefit from this? What is, what is the benefit? Because she doesn't get a benefit. But she's in essence saying, I, if, if I'm not going to get the baby, no one will. This is about me. I'm not worried about the, as we would say, the least of these, the most vulnerable in this situation. I'm worried about me. The second woman says, give her to the first. Now, this was of no direct benefit to to that second mother. She was losing, in a sense, if you will, but she understood who was the vulnerable in this case. Who was it that needed to be thought of first? So many in our world today, just that's, are focused on me living. But... If you step back, and I think many of you, as we've seen stuff through the, especially the, the outpouring of things that have happened over the last several years, more and more are just having our eyes awoken, more and more, to this understanding. It doesn't work. 
We can cover this all up in our home lives and pretend that it doesn't matter and that as long as it's below the surface, no big deal. As long as no one else knows, it, what, what's it matter, right? It's not a problem until it blows up. And yet we continue to live that way. People are being killed. Homes are destroyed. Relationships broken. The world is bleeding. Tears are flowing. We need, this, this me life is what Jesus was calling us to crucify. We need to get rid of that and live as Jesus offered. Because we read that even that, however, cannot, so even when we live the me life, we cannot be separated from the love of God. And that, that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's his love that encourages, enables us, and teaches us to choose to live for the greater good, not just our good. But you've got to choose. Every minute, every day, every situation, every relationship holds that choice. So in response to God's offer, what does Solomon do? He chose, in that moment of his life, a we attitude. He asked for a listening heart, a heart with ears that would hear the pain of the world, the needs of the people, and the voice of God. He didn't ask for any of those things that many would ask for. And it pleased the Lord. I'm going to ask you a question. If everybody feels like they got the answer, go ahead and respond. So, what, what, do you, what would you say is the most, or what do you think people would say is the most precious commodity of this world? Say it. Commodity? Yeah. What is, are you, gold? What's that? Okay, gold. I thought you said something else at first. I thought, a lot of times, so gold is definitely a precious um, financial commodity, definitely. A lot of people would say, you know, what's one thing people would trade their money for? Usually the response I get is time. So time is a precious commodity as well. But I'm going to go one step further and say time is not the most precious commodity in the world either. It's godly wisdom. Because if you don't have godly wisdom, you can have all the time in the world and you'll waste it. You can have all the money in the world and you'll waste it. Godly wisdom is the most precious commodity in our world. Why is it a commodity? Because it's so rare to find. God's wisdom gives us knowledge and understanding about how to discern what is good and evil, what is right and wrong. And it's the basis that we have the courage to live a life set apart from God. Brothers and sisters, it's only going to get harder in this country to live a life set apart for God. Your money's not going to buy you out if you have money. That time is coming. What's required is godly wisdom and discernment in these times where truth is virtually impossible to find. Because of the fallen nature of our world and of humanity, every thought, every decision, every deed requires careful discernment. Because we are, as the song says, we are prone to wander. When David, think of David one more time, when David neglected to be where he was, David, in a different story, he was supposed to be out fighting with his troops. He decides to take it easy, stay back behind, and what happens? It's when he commits a sin with Bathsheba. In 1 Kings chapter 11, further on, we read that Solomon, he of great wisdom, so let this be a warning. He fell captive to intermarrying with women who worshipped other gods. So here's this wisest guy out there, and he falls prey to one of the most basic things that God kept repeating them over and over and over again. So don't think that you're exempt from making these decisions. Because of this, Solomon's heart was eventually turned away from Yahweh. 
And we actually read in the scripture, it says it was only on the account of his father, who was a man after God's own heart, that Solomon didn't lose his kingdom immediately. That's how quickly his life turned. Now, as I prepare to close here, if, you've re- if you read a couple verses past, which I hope you all did, because this is further down the, the line in our reading, in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. It was a dream. It was a dream, but it's not just a dream. You may think, why am I bringing this up now? What's the big deal? It's a dream, you know? But it doesn't mean that it wasn't real. And it doesn't mean that the fact that he woke up was the end of the dream and that somehow now he could go about his business. In fact, his awakening was the beginning of a new reality. He awoke to a new possibility for himself and for his people. It can be realized every time that Solomon chose to focus on the greater good of the people instead of his own good. We need, our world needs to experience the joyous reality of a life lived well under the authority of Jesus. God has entrusted us each with Solomon's dream. And it's well past time that we wake up. That we ask for and live with that wisdom. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3 that God has made the church to make the manifold wisdom known about God. To who? To the powers of the heavens above. When we reflect the wisdom of God, even the angels and the demons look down and see who God is. They acknowledge him because of what we were called to be as a body. How do we get this wisdom? Where does it come from? We need that intake. And it comes through prayer and through reading scriptures. But it's incredibly vital that we demonstrate this learned wisdom by working it out in the world. Wisdom doesn't just happen because, oh, here you go, here's a block of wisdom for you. No, some of the wisdom is by learning as you go. Trying things out and saying, you know, this is what God is calling me to in a direction, but as a person, I'm going to still make some mistakes. But you learn by growing. So living out and sharing the gospel can never be done alone. Anybody sit in front of their mirror and share the gospel with themselves? Not really the point of what we're going for. So to choose, if you want to choose to live or want to continue to live a gospel-centered life, you've got to choose a we living Now, you may be sensing, I've heard this sentiment from people in my past, but evil is encroaching the world. There's all of this stuff that's coming in, so we need to seclude ourselves and remove ourselves from them. We want to shrink back, and so if we can just stay clustered in with those who think exactly how we do, we won't have to worry about the stuff that's out there. But the problem with that is, well, there's two problems, but the problem I'm going to address today is, Something that's encroaching doesn't just stop because you move back. It keeps encroaching further and further. The reality is that the presence of evil should remind us and give us confidence that the presence of God, the one who loves us and willingly sent his son to die for us, is here. He's the one that fights our battles. So maybe you've made this decision in your life already. But maybe you found yourself challenged a little bit, and maybe in a phase of your life. What's it going to be? Each person here has to decide for themselves. Are you going to live for yourself? Are you going to live the me life? Or are you going to live for others? The we life. Remember, we are called to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. And let each of you look not only to your own interests, 
but also to the interests of others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging that it is very tempting to want to live for ourselves and that when When things happen in our life, it's very easy to want to seclude ourselves and to say, well, what do I need to do? How can I fix this problem? Or how can I uh, make things better? And Lord, yet you called us to turn to you, to submit those things to you. And part of that as well in this we living is an acknowledgement that we cannot do these things on our own. We need each other. We need you. Lord, you have chosen, whether we like it or not, whether we, whether we think that it could have just been done easier if you had just taken care of it, Lord, you have called us to be your hands and feet. And so this requires us sometimes to close our mouth and listen and ask, you know, maybe ask a question and listen to what are the needs of those even that are sitting next to us as we speak. Maybe it's a husband or a wife. Maybe it's a son or a daughter. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's someone that you don't even know that well. Lord, we acknowledge that uh, when you sent your son, he, he, he taught us the mindset about being willing to lay down our life, to put others first, to take off the cloak if someone asked for it and give it to them, to go an extra mile if someone demanded it. Lord, that is, that is a life of self-sacrifice, self-giving, humility. And often there's no, there's no uh, personal gratification or glorification or, or um, benefit there. And so we are often just too busy, too in tune with, with the things that we are after that we aren't willing to even pay any mind. Lord, and yet those opportunities, those times where you present yourself, as we present ourselves as a people of the kingdom, of the gospel, that want to invite others into our journey. Lord, we know that you are at work in every person's life. And we are called to plant seeds. We are called to, to, um, to speak your truth as you have seen fit. Lord, we know that your timing is perfect and uh, you've asked that all we do is be available. You know that we know that you don't even need us, and yet you lovingly delight when we are posturing our lives in such a way that we are bringing glory to you through others. In your name, we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction, and then we will have a closing song. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to his gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings and is known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God now and forevermore, who receives the glory alone. Amen. Remember, church, you are sent.